Hello and welcome back to Dream Girl Podcast. Today I am super excited because we're launching season four with an amazing guest. I'm Sheen, your host, and today we're welcoming Dr. Sara Almadani. <laughs> and Sara is amazing. She's a reality TV star, but also she is an absolute business badass. And she has over 140 awards, especially in entrepreneurship, and has an honorary PhD. She has nine companies, started her first business at the age of 15. And she's Emirati, single mother, rocks 68 tattoos. Is it still 68? 79. Oh, we've updated it. Oh, yeah. There's sto- if there's a story, there's a tattoo. <laughs> Always. 79 tattoos. And she has been smashing through stereotypes of Arab women. And she shares very openly her journey through adversity, both in her personal and professional life. So hello, Sarah. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited for this conversation. And I think if we give a little bit of context in terms of how I got to meet Sarah was through Saba. Yeah, Saba so, was one of my close friends and my business partner. Yes, and yeah. Saba was the first episode of the previous season. Oh, wow, she was? <laughs> yes. Is this planned? No. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm honored. Thank you so much. No, honestly, I just want to say when she put us in touch and we started the messaging, you are so warm and there's like some light coming out of you. And it just felt like I was talking to a friend, which is incredible. That's how it should be with everybody, but sadly it's not. It's not. No, because we are all souls. We are here for an experience. We're here to enjoy life. It's a short period of time. Yeah. Let's not take it too seriously. And I feel like we were born with one language and we die with one language, which is love. And I choose love every single day. And it's God's language. So it's sad to see that a lot of people don't practice it with everyone and everyone has boundaries and walls. Mm. But in the end, we're all humans. I agree. I agree. And I think because I've been stalking you for the past two days, right, preparing for this podcast. (laughs) And I was telling you just before we started, I love your grace in interviews and whenever people are asking you questions that... I would have probably not been as graceful as you (laughs) in replying, but I love how you can filter all of this and put your emotions to the side whenever you're interacting with others. And how do you do that? Well, look, it all goes back to my purpose. Like, what is my purpose in life? I'm a light worker. I'm here to help educate and heal humanity. That that's my life purpose. So if I'm sitting with someone who's being an an ignorant Mm -hmm. in an interview or being a complete asshole in an (laughs) interview, and I'm trying to educate, it's that I have to go beyond my ego, which is, let me fight back, yeah. and go like, hey, focus on your purpose, you know? And that's mm. it. You, you're educating them as you go. Agreed, yeah. agreed. I want to ask you, what is a light worker for people who don't know? So I have it actually tattooed here. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so a light worker basically is a person that believes that God created them chosen for one purpose it's not from an egoistic perspective like oh i'm special i'm chosen no it's more like god chose me my purpose is to bring light into people's lives and i live for that purpose whether it's through my communication every day with people um, supporting somebody helping somebody even in my business or my work everywhere i go i feel like i'm supposed to bring light to people's lives and this is what you said in the beginning. You said when I spoke to you, yeah. you felt warm. Yeah. And I feel like that is my purpose. It's my purpose walking in a room before me or replying to a message before I do in a text, you know? Mm. So, yeah, that's what a light worker is. Somebody who wants to heal, uh, bring love, bring light, and just uh, is looking out for humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, this is completely going off the rail of what I had planned for this conversation, but I'm just going to ask, so how did you come across this? How did you discover that this is your passion? I'm an empath, Mm -hmm. and I've always had love for people, and I didn't understand why. Like, Mm. even when they do me wrong, I'm still kind and loving. People confuse you when you are like that. They tell you, ah, you're too weak, Mm. you're going to be used, you're soft, you're You're this, you're this. (laughs) But what they don't understand, it takes a lot of strength to remain kind and loving in a world like the world we live today and with people similar to the people we live with today. Mm -hmm. Because not everybody's kind and loving. Mm -mm. So for you to remain the same instead of choosing the easy way out, which is, uh, it's it's easy to be rude. It's easy to reply back in a cold way. It's easy to be dismissive. It's very easy. But to remain true to who you are, that's what opened my eyes. I was like, I don't believe it's a weakness because it hurts me to remain kind, yet I'm remaining kind. And that's where, when you are a curious person, you go deep and you try to understand what are these things? Why am I doing these things? And when your intentions are in the right place and you're aligned, 
and you know exactly what you want to know and you're curious about it, everything comes to place. And I remember one day I was sitting and instead of writing fireworks on a search, I, me and my friends were having a debate. Oh, how much do fireworks cost per second? <clears throat> And she was saying a number, I was saying a number, because these things are damn expensive. Yeah. So while I was doing that, instead of writing fireworks, I wrote Lightworks. Mm -hmm. And then Google corrected me to a Lightworker. I was like, what is Lightworker? And it's like, I swear to God, it's like it was sent to me. Because in my mind, I really was on a mission to find out what my purpose is and why am I like that. So it's crazy how just a normal conversation. Mm, happy just coincidence, right? Switch. I, I don't think it's a coincidence. No. <laughs> no, everything is meant to happen. So yeah. it was it alignment, basically. Okay. Or I believe that God sends you messages or the universe sends you messages through people, through things. You just have to keep your eye open. Mm. Because I, I've noticed this. Like you said, you said you're like coincidence. Yeah. But we've been programmed to think it's a coincidence. Yes. But it's not. Mm. It's literally alignment. And then I started reading and reading and reading, and I was like, oh my God, that is exactly how I feel. Mm. And I went in depth about it, and yeah, and then I realized that is my purpose. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to move you back a few steps now. So, because I want to talk to you about entrepreneurship, being a woman professional, and being on reality TV, and then we'll go into personal growth and all of that. So, you started your first business at the age of 15. Yeah. What was that like? To be honest, when I asked my parents, they were like, you were always an odd kid. Uh, my mom's like, you started walking at the age of, I think, nine months, if I'm not mistaken, or 10 months. That's very young, right? It is young. And I started speaking at the age of 10 months. So my mom thought I was like either possessed or an alien. Uh, but she's pretty sure she gave birth to me. So, so I'm not an alien. <laughs> you were in a rush. <laughs> yeah. So I think that I was way more mature than my age. Mm-hmm. And my mom and my dad told me that by the age of three and four, I was massaging them for money. And by the age of five and six, I think, I'm not sh pretty sure about the numbers, but I was buying candy and reselling it to my cousins. So the business started younger than that. Younger than that. But at the age of three and four, you're not searching for financial mm -mm. Uh, like independence, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't that what weird. What expenses did you have? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> Baby food diapers. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it was more like, I didn't know why I did it. Mm. I just did it. And I enjoyed it. And I was recruiting my cousins to work for me as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like, I had leadership in me, like from the get-go. But when I started at the age of 15, I was a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. I didn't study fashion. I had no information, no background. But I just started. And it wasn't easy because imagine trying to go to the government to get a license at this age. It wasn't allowed. There was no such thing. Mm. We're talking about 2005 or four. I'm not sure. But it was around that time. Right. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a normal thing to have a 15 year old with a business license, but we managed to get it. Mm. And just being a kid, having a team around me, I remember my tailors were in their forties and they wouldn't listen. And they, they were Indian, so they would call me bacha, bacha, <laughs> yeah. bacha. Like a kid, they would call me. And I was like, oh God. But I was patient and it took a couple of months for them to feel like, all right, you know, drop the ego, she's the boss, whether Let's we like it. it or not, yeah. let's just work together. And yeah, the journey was great. It was interesting. I feel like the price of doing the business at the age of 15 was dropping university and it was totally worth it mm. because life and business and interacting with people taught me way much more than a textbook would or a university would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because one question I get a lot of very often is how do you know when is the right time to pivot, right? Which is exactly what you've done. You've pivoted many times. You decided that the business was better than your education at that point. Yeah. So you decided to change course. And given that you have so many different companies in different fields as well, so you've pivoted many times there. What's your approach whenever it's like there's a pivot point in your life? How do you assess whether you make the jump or not? What were we conditioned to think? Do it when you find the right time. When the time right, is right. Right. That's how we've been conditioned mm. to always like wait mm -hmm. until the time becomes right. But time doesn't exist. We do. So there is no right time. I create the right time. Mm -hmm. So it's more of switching your mindset to, I'm not going to wait till it's easy. I'm not going to wait till things get better because time is moving. My age is moving. My life is moving. My opportunities, the chances, everything is moving. Mm -hmm. So you create the right time. And I just did it. I just did what I felt without having fear of failing because I was never ashamed of, of failing. So when I was in university, I just didn't feel right. It didn't sit well with me. 
it was fun. I learned a lot. I made a lot of friends in these like two and a half years of university. I was studying film directing and acting. So it wasn't like math and physics. But although I was doing what I love, it didn't feel right. And what felt right was leaving it all behind and pissing off everyone in the family <laughs> and just doing what I want. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, this is amazing, right? You have the courage of being authentic to yourself and knowing what you want and standing by it, even if, as you say, you piss off everyone else along yeah. the way. How, where does that courage come from for you? Okay, to be honest, when I was young, I was just rebellious by nature. Okay. But as I got older, I understood why I rebelled. So when I was young, I just left. And I was like, I just want to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, oh, she's disrespectful. She's stubborn. She's going through a phase, whatever. She's a teenager, no, 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 all that. But the truth is, this was the stereotype everyone was putting across as I am as a person. Yes. And they're like, oh, she's this, this. They were labeling me. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, I was just being authentic to myself now that I grow up and I realize that, okay, by leaving university, I did piss off a lot of family members, my mom, my dad. But why does it piss them off? Because they have a dream of seeing me graduate from university, but that's their dream. That's not mine. That's mm -mm. their problem. That's not mine. Mm -mm. So as I grew up and I went through my journey into discovering who I am, I just realized that no matter what, you're, what you choose to do in life, you're the one that pays the price. So why are people taking that decision for me? If I took a decision and I ended up broke, nobody would help me. Would my friends pay me? My friends that told me not to do this or to do this, everyone will give you free advice, but when shit hits the fan, nobody's there for you. So you realize that you are the captain, you are the master of your soul, you're the master of all your decisions. And once you learn that power that you have, your whole life changes. Wow, that's really powerful. It, it, everybody has that power. It's, right. not, it's not that I'm, I'm born with superpowers. Yeah. It's just that I know of my superpowers. Mm. A lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. And they're in the sleepers effect where they're just, you know, in the rat race. They're working, waking up, sleeping, eating. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. But there is much more to being human um, and much more divine powers to you as a human being than just what you think you have. I agree. And I think that's very powerful what you said in terms of people will give you free advice but when things don't work out, these people are nowhere to be seen. <laughs> no. Or try this. Uh, Sarah, don't do this. Uh, we love you. We're telling you this because we love you. It's our, our advice. We care about you. Okay. I need $50,000. Everybody disappears. <laughs> it's like, so now where is the love? Where is the care? Where is the support? Yeah. It's like everyone will give you free advice because they can, because everybody's either projecting or deflecting or just like, you know, being negative. Mm -hmm. Whatever people tell me, I always take it as their limitations, their projection. That's how they see themselves. Mm -hmm. But they think that I'm like them, but I'm not like them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm not. And there's that saying of um, never take advice from someone who has never worn your shoes on how to tie your laces. A hundred percent. Why would I? <laughs> right. Why, why, for example, there was this stay at home mom. And I have nothing against stay-at-home moms. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. She was advising me about what business risk to take and not. So it's like, girl, you are living in a very comfortable comfort zone. Right. You chose your choices. I'm the one hustling. I'm the single mom. I'm the one paying bills. You have a husband that do that and helps you with it. So it's like, why would I take advice from you? But humans are like that. Mm -hmm. It's like I sit down and a girl walks in and she's like, guys, I decided to get divorced. What do you think? Mm -hmm. It's like, what do we think? It's like, it's like, why do we have to think about this? No, but why are you even giving us that power? Right. Why are you, why are you handing me your powers to make a decision for you or influence your decision? And this is a mistake a lot of people do. I want to leave my job. I want to do this. I want to do this. They're seeking permission from the outer world while the only permission you need is from you. That's mm. it. Um, all my decisions are taken by me, for me, no matter how disastrous they are, no matter how much failure they bring or happiness or success, my decision's mine. Mm hmm Yes. I might run my decision by someone I care and I know cares for me. Yes. But I'm not asking them to take a decision. I'm running my decision by them. Mm -hmm. But when you run a decision, the decisions are already taken. So you're just telling them. Mm. So it's okay to be open about these things, but to go and seek validation and to ask for permission, that is crazy to me. Insane. No, you know, I've done this in the past when I was thinking about leaving my corporate job to go into the entrepreneur world. And I was asking people, what do you think? And I was so overwhelmed with negativity. Everyone was like, don't do it. 
this is not right. Why would you do that? Is you're not ready. This is not the right time. And as you said, if you just run your decision by them, it's a completely different conversation. Yeah. But suddenly people feel like they have a say in what you do. And I think, as you said, it comes from their limitations and from them being scared of that for themselves yeah. or being scared of you getting ahead of them sometimes. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Even if if you take it, let's take it from a different perspective. Let's talk about life advice. Mm relationship advice a girl is telling me to leave a toxic let's say for example boyfriend right. or husband and she says you know your worth you know this blah, blah blah or do this or do that or do this but she is in a toxic relationship and she's not doing she's anything not leaving. about it she's not leaving <laughs> so it's like do are you even giving me true advice or are you reflecting based on your situation because you're living in a toxic relationship mm -hmm. My problem with my spouse or my boyfriend might be something very simple, mm -hmm. but you're making it bigger than it is because you're reflecting on your situation. Yes. So for me, I think the more private you are about what you do in your life, mm. the more happier you are. Even if the decisions you take are wrong, it's completely fine to do wrong things. <laughs> But we've been programmed not to do it. We're, we're very conditioned people. Like perfection is so prized. Yeah, it's, it's like failure is embarrassing. It's always attached to shame and guilt. Mm. You have to be guilty if you fail. You have to be ashamed if you fail. I'm not. I speak openly about my failures because I've learned much more from failure than I've done from mentors, people, uh, universities, books, school, anything. Failure is the most expensive teacher. <laughs> but it's a teacher. Right. You know? I feel... Like, if people only understood that you never lose, you either win or learn. There is oh, yeah. no losing in the process. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just switching your mindset. Mm -hmm. That's the only power. Everyone's like, oh, how do you do it, Sarah? How do you... Do? It's just that my mindset, I switched it. You flip the switch and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And I think while we're talking about this, um, I want to switch into, you know, having friends. Because as you said, it, you can go run your decision with people that you trust and, yeah. you know, they have your best interest at heart and therefore you trust what they would say to you. I feel like growing up, this equation with friends especially changes a lot. And I've seen myself lose a lot of friends as I grew up. And recently now, you know, when I've become a bit more in the public eye and recently I had a video go viral, I was really surprised by... You know, back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's just like the people that you expect would be happy for you are not necessarily happy for you. They were they were cheering you on as long as you were struggling. But once the struggle is over, it's like yeah. they're gone because yeah. they, they, they can't celebrate your happiness for you. How, how, how do you deal with that? I call it the purge. Ooh, let's hear it. <laughs> so every time I achieve a milestone in my life or achieve success, I go through a purge with all my friends. And mm. I watch carefully the ones who celebrate me, yes. remain in my life, the ones who I feel like, you can read the room. You can, you can tell what's happening. And the ones that are not, I cut them off completely. I'm on a diet called healthy people diet. And I don't give a shit. If good. you're good, you taste good, you're mm. amazing. If you're bad for my energy, if you're bad for me, you're out of my life. So as you're right, as you grow older yeah. and you are more confident and you know exactly who you are, you're like a tree that sheds its leaves. Mm -hmm. A lot of people fall off and it's completely fine. I'd rather have a small circle because I'm all about quality, not quantity. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that. I used to be a very popular kid in school. Same. But yeah, but now I like my circles like this small. <laughs> I barely do anything. I barely go out. But I, I love it because my energy is preserved, my sanity is preserved, my positivity is preserved. It's like you're untouchable mm. and you don't give people that access anymore. So your friends that came back after your video went viral mm -hmm. are the people you should not give access to anymore. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no. <laughs> where were you when I wasn't yeah. that viral? Right. Where, where were, were you? you? Yeah, where were you? Oh, suddenly, all of a sudden, now you want to be my friend. Yeah. It's like, they all make fun of you, but when you make it, they all want to be you. Exactly. The, mm -hmm. There was a lot of conversations about, oh, why does she think people should listen to her? <laughs> and oh, now... Really? Yeah. And oh, now they're listening. Yeah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yep. I've been there, done right. that, wore a t-shirt. I know that. <laughs> I know that feeling. But it's so interesting because then it's a question of, did I choose my friends wrong? But clearly not, because I feel like everybody goes through this purge eventually. Before we continue with this episode, we're going to go for a quick ad break for a word from our sponsor. This episode has been kindly sponsored by Loyalty to Your Soul. For the first time, they are bringing the transformative three days workshop to Dubai from the 27th to 29th of October. Self-awareness and emotional intelligence are invaluable 
valuable skills in any career to navigate interpersonal relationships, communicate effectively, and lead with empathy. This workshop will dive into practical tools on how to regulate your emotions and how to find your purpose. So join Noor and Mysore from the inner space, the facilitators of this workshop, to embrace transformation and inner growth. Check out the links to register and my discount code in the description boxes below. Thank you. Yeah, no, um, you could look, the thing is, don't be so hard on yourself because at a certain age, you enjoy those friends. Yes. They fit your life perfectly. Yeah. But at a certain point where you shift or move in your life, they don't fit. And it's completely normal. They don't fit. Yeah, it's completely normal. Your clothes change, your body change size, mm. your jeans change size, your shoes yeah. change size. It's completely fine for people to fall off as well. Mm. So it's it's okay. But don't regret the time you had with them because no. at that time, it, it was, was great. great. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Okay. But like, it's, it's funny because you're an empath as well. I'm an empath as well. But how do you deal with cutting people out and not feeling regret or guilt about that? I think the, the issue with a lot of empaths is that they love people, but they don't love themselves. Mm. Oops. Empathy is a superpower, but you need to learn how to use it. Mm. You need to master the art of empathy. And you cannot go out there and help, help the world and change the world and heal the world while you're breaking and unhealing and unrepairing yourself. Like, it doesn't make sense because you, so you're good to everybody, but you're not good to yourself. And then at the end of the day, you cannot fill from an empty cup. Mm -mm. No. So you have to learn how to balance loving yourself and then loving others, doing for yourself and then doing for others. Put yourself first. And that's the biggest mistake empaths still can't master. They feel guilty yes. when they put themselves first. It sounds selfish to them, yeah, right? But yeah, but it's selfish. But it's, no, it's not selfish. <laughs> it's self-love at this point. Yeah, it's 100% self-love. But again, we are conditioned to feel like if you're a good person, mm. you got to give everything to people. You got to sacrifice. You can't put yourself first. But this is toxic to the core. No, being an empath is about learning that you have a superpower and never change and never stop being an empath. It's not a weakness. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you got to learn how to use that power because... It's like waking up and finding out that your eyes has laser beam that can melt things. And you're like blinking and melting everything around you. It's like you have a superpower. Yeah. Now learn how to use it. Mm. Put glasses on. Learn how to master your power. So it's the same thing. It's okay to be an empath, but learn how to use that power in the right way. Otherwise, you will be a toxic empath, mm. a destructive empath, which means like you're not really serving humanity because you're destroying yourself. And when you're destroying yourself and you're helping the world, you're not being the best version or not showing up for the people you love around you as your kids, your family, your other half, mm. because you are drained. And you ask yourself, I don't know what's wrong with me while I'm drained. You're draining yourself. <laughs> you are not good to yourself. You're good to everybody but yourself. And that's not empathy. Mm. That's toxic empathy, to be honest. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I feel attacked here, but you're right. No, it it's is. True. I'm sorry. <laughs> it should start from home, right? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Does it make sense to you if I tell you, I do a lot of charity work. My company donates a lot of money to a lot of entities. But in my company, I have people who are suffering and cannot pay their insurances and their kids are not eating mm. and the salaries are low. Does it make, does no. it make sense to you that I'm serving everybody, but inside mm. my organization, everyone's suffering? No. It doesn't make sense. Right. So I'm sorry, but I love empaths. But <laughs> if you are not the empath that knows how to practice self-love, mm. then you're a toxic empath. And you're not necessarily the best example. Mm. Yeah. No, I love that. You know, recently I read this book, which is um, The Five People You Meet in Heaven. Have you read this? No. Oh, you'll love this book. It's basically someone who dies in the first page and then they go to heaven and meet five people from their life. Okay. And the main lesson overall that I took from the book was that the whole thing that your relationship with yourself makes a huge difference. 100%. In the world. And if you can't have a good relationship with yourself, accepting your challenges, not having a victim mentality and giving to others and how much do you impact people around you yeah. is all what makes your life worth it. I believe in that. Like, I believe that even the way you look at yourself and the way you treat yourself, even after we die and move to the next level, mm -hmm. okay, that affects you a lot. Yes. If you haven't picked up the right lesson here on earth because i feel like we are god put us here to learn because if we were just souls we'll be energy mm -hmm. we'll never know what does pain feel like what does love feel like what does a flower smell like we'll not know any of these things but god gave us an opportunity to have an experience and gave us this body as a vessel to come on earth for a short period of time a school 
we graduate, we go to the next level. And I feel like if you leave not knowing how to love yourself, you're missing a lot moving forward. So it's very important. And I feel like it's so underrated. I see people spend more money on Birkins and on like uh, spa treatments than they spend on like repairing their soul or their mental health. Therapy. <laughs> Therapy. You know why? Because people are seeking validation public validation from people. Mm. I'm pretty sure your soul doesn't need a Birkin. I'm pretty sure your friends do because you need to fit. <laughs> but I've seen people who spend a lot of money wasting their life like that, you know, mm. just living just for the sake of like enjoying it in the wrong ways. While if you focus on your mental health and you invest a lot in your mental health, oh my God, like you have no idea. I am no longer on survival mode. Yeah. Whether I lose or not, whether I have money or not, whether I grow or not, whether I, I reach successful in career, whatever or not, whether I'm in a relationship or not, mm -hmm. I'm completely fulfilled and I'm ready to die any second. I'm not mm -hmm. scared because I have so much gratitude and abundance inside and self-love that I'm not no longer on survival mode. And that's the mistake. A lot of people are on survival mode. I need to work so I can make money. I need to eat so I can live. I need to. <laughs> it's like the minute you stop being on survival mode is the minute you legit start living and stop existing, you know, and, and that's that's what self-love does to you. That is so true. Like and a lot of people preach, enjoy the journey. Don't wait for the destination. But I don't think people put that into practice. No, everyone is working just, towards the next nice milestone, quote. right? Next yeah. milestone. Okay, I got this job. Now, how do I get promoted? How do I make more money? How Survival do I... mode. It yeah. Literally, and it's always like there's always something bigger. And that's the problem, right? Yeah. You will never be done with no, that journey. No, you'll never be done. I like realized the thing is when you heal, mm -hmm. what they don't tell you is that it becomes lonely. No, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it becomes really lonely because then you start realizing who's working on himself, who's not, who's doing what they have to do, mm. who's who's doing the work, who's putting in the work, who's not, who's just settling for who they are. So you start reading people's energy and then you realize I have boundaries now. I'm in a healthy state of my life. I'm healed. I, I have boundaries. So when you have boundaries, you feel like you're lonely because you don't want to mix with everybody anymore. Right. So yeah, that, that's, that's a huge thing. So I feel like uh, it's like... I walk around and I, I, I look at people and I realize exactly who I want to be next to and who, who I don't mm, want to be next to. Mm. So healing is a lonely journey, but it's a profound journey because I'd rather be lonely. But you're at peace. At peace. Mm. And by the way, even when people say you're lonely, you're never lonely. My God, God, the universe, <laughs> like me, myself and I, more than enough for me to be on my own. Yeah. So I'd rather do that than be at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Mm. I cannot. I cannot. Oh my God, kill me. <laughs> I barely go to events. I swear to God, I barely go out. I'm either meditating, reading things about self-growth, reflecting, downloading mm. information, and just like being curious. You know, that's it. If you'd ask me what's my biggest fear, my biggest fear is to exist and not to live, to die mm. while not living my life at the Fully. fullest. Yeah. Yeah. And at the fullest, I don't mean going to Saint-Tropez and riding a yacht <laughs> no. on a party and putting stories about it. I mean, living as an authentic life, knowing exactly why my soul is even on this earth, why God created me, what's good for me, and learn how to love myself, basically. Mm. Yeah, that's living. The rest Honestly. is all existing. Because it's just full, being fulfilled, right? 100%, yeah, 100%. Honestly, when I look at people who think that they're living, but from a healed person's perspective, an awakened person's perspective. You look at them, you're like, you know, you're not living, you're existing. And, you know, they're buying whatever they have to buy. They're collecting all the money they have to collect. They're tr they're doing everything that they want to do and just so they can fit, you know? Mm -hmm. When I look at these people, I go like, you're killing yourself to work so hard to make that money, to buy that bag so your friends can see it. But once you're gone, when you die, that bag goes nowhere. That <laughs> money goes nowhere. That no. car, that house, that that fancy horse you have at home, nothing yeah. goes with you. It's all borrowed. So while you're living this limited amount of time in this world, it's like, what are you collecting? Things? Mm. I'd rather collect memories. I'd, I'd rather like leave an impact. I'd rather- Good deeds, right? Yeah, good <laughs> deeds. Like yeah. I, I think you're immortal when you leave a good impression, when you leave some a piece of you in everyone's heart. It's not when you leave your Birkin collection behind. So yeah, it's- it's sad to see what people are collecting mm. and what they're enjoying instead of understanding what life is really about.
It breaks my heart. Yeah, yeah. But the, the problem is society really pushes for these things, right? Like validation is, is really turning people into these like vapid uh, vehicles of just receiving validations with social media and the standards of beauty. And everyone is comparing themselves to each other, whether it's in terms of how they look, how much money they're making. Then it, it's like, especially the young people coming through and you have a son you're raising, right? Yeah. How, how do you protect the young people from this and make sure that they know themselves before they go Got into it. society with this? So first of all, to answer the first part of your question yeah. is that that's what society tells us. Yes. That to be happy, you need to buy this car, you need to buy this house, you need to buy this dress. To be happy, you need to do this procedure, buy this makeup, buy this perfume. But if we really think about it, they're just industries trying to sell. And they make a lot of money from our insecurities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they make a lot of money from our insecurities. And th they will try to make you feel insecure about everything you have. And they will make you feel like you need to seek validation as long as you live because you make them money. Mm. But that's the sad part where people are under a sleeper's effect. Mm -hmm. And they're just, you know, falling into that trap and they're purchasing, purchasing like uh, age, uh, companies and like organizations are getting bigger and richer while you're just here spending just to seek validation. So it's a sold art sold to us by the industries around us because that's how the industries grow. But a fulfilled person doesn't fall for this trap. Yeah, every now and then if I like a bag, if I like a car, yeah. like I'd buy it. Mm. I'm not saying don't balance, don't enjoy life, don't enjoy the luxuries but of life. But you're buying it for your own contentment, right? Yeah, but yeah. it's not like, but I'm not consumed by it and I don't seek validation through it. Mm. Zero. I don't care if you like me or not. I would wear from like any brand, from the top brand down to Shein. I don't care. As long as I look good, I look yeah. good. You know, I don't need to seek validation through people or through how I look or anything mm. like that. Because if you are being chosen because of what you have, one day someone will come with more things and they'll choose them against then you. Then what? Yeah. Then what? You know, then your friends will spit you out so easily from the circle. It's just sad, you know, but people should wake up and understand that this, all these things are being sold to us through the media because industries are feeding on us, mm -hmm. feeding on our insecurities. And that's the sad truth. Yeah, but you know, when I moved to Dubai, I moved only two years ago. Yeah. So many times people told me I had a really shitty little Citroen car. And everyone would be like, oh, your car is so cute. But you know, people won't respect you when you get out of that what? car. What? <laughs> they were on the street, people will bully you. And I was like, it, it is kind of true. I get bullied on the street, but that's probably because I drive like a grandma. But it's like, why? And everyone was like, you know, you need to have these three watches because you need to wear this kind of watch when you go to this kind of meeting because people will judge you and your worth based on that and i was like that oh is Lord. so sad that is sad <laughs> right if i am entering a meeting and you're judging me based on my watch i don't want to be in this meeting i don't want to work with you no i don't want to be with you i don't want to be around <laughs> we will you. not get along <laughs> yeah you got to choose me for this and this yeah. <laughs> because i can be covered in every brand in the world but i might have the nastiest heart the nastiest intention the nastiest mind so what do you like more mm. i just don't understand you know? Yeah. So, no, I don't care. Babe, I, I, I swear to God, I take normal taxis sometimes. Good, like, me like too. The, well, the ones with the taxi Hella, sign. Yeah. Yeah, I take that. And I go to meetings and I do photo shoots and everyone would look at me and I go like, what? You it's, guys don't take taxis? It's like, taking you from A to Z. No, That's it's, it. It's like, it's like since when has flying economy or carrying Shameful. a normal bag or driving a normal car something that's downgrading a person in society. Mm -hmm. That's so embarrassing on every single level. Right. I just don't understand. Like a lot of friends used to tell me, oh my God, of course you always fly business. I'm like, hell no. If it makes sense, yes. I would fly business. If the price makes sense to me, I will fly business. Yeah, but you got money. You got I don't care. I have a mind as well. But I do fly economy and I'm not ashamed of that sometimes. Good. Yeah, but how arrogant is it for a person to think I'm in business class and everyone in economy is not worth it? There are 300 people sitting in economy. They're all not worth it. Three of them might be valued more than you are sitting exactly. in business class. Like, I'm, so, I'm completely sorry. Yeah. But since when did the world become so, like, uh, like empty, so mm. shallow that we judge people based on whether they fly economy or not? This is very embarrassing. Yeah. And I'm embarrassed to live in a world like this, to be honest. I fly everything. I do anything. I don't care. Like me, you know, like me, like... I've, I've flown economy sometimes where people recognized who I am yeah. and I took pictures with them in economy. I don't care. We're humans. 
right? It's a seat on the same plane. You're still taking you from one point to the other. Like, like wake <laughs> up. It's sad that you have to pay 50,000 dirhams just to feel like you're worth it. You're right. valuable. Honey, I'm class. Whether I sit in economy or not, I know my value. Exactly. My value does not drop. So it's sad that your value drops if you change your seat. And to me, these are people with the fragile ego. Mm, you know? Definitely. Yeah, fragile personalities, fragile ego, and very unhuman. Mm. Because when you look at people like that, you're not a human. You're stuck up, you know? Mm -hmm. you're, your nose is too high. Yeah, you think you're better you Sit than down and be else. humble. Yeah, yeah, yeah so true. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, now I, I want to talk about something a little bit related, but a little bit not as well. You know, so I wonder who gets the most crap? Me who's never been married or you who've been through it twice? Both. <laughs> right? <laughs> You have no idea. I know you get the pressure from society. Oh, oh yeah. you're getting older. You're not going to get kids. And, uh, I'm 30 as well now. My so. love, do it when you're ready. Your <laughs> eggs are going to be fresh until you're 50 probably. Just just do it when you're ready. Ignore right? people. Yeah, it's just, it's just like cultural things and they're very toxic. Don't let anyone push you because mm. if you're pushed based on, oh my God, uh, I'm getting older. Oh yeah. my God, I, I need to get kids. Oh my God, my age. Then you will settle for any guy that comes in. Mm. And settling, trust me, over here, yeah. settle twice. Don't settle. <laughs> don't. <laughs> There's an Egyptian actress that got married 11 times. My mom was like, so you're following her footsteps? I'm like, girl. You, you still have a lot to go. I'm like, mom, <laughs> if it takes me 11 marriages so to find the right person, I'm like, get ready. Prepare mm. your dresses. Your daughter is doing it 11 <laughs> times. I don't care. I right. live once in this 3D world. I want to live it the way I want. Yeah. And if it takes 11 marriages to find the right person, mm. I'm up for it. But it's funny how everyone thinks they have a say in this, right? <sighs> yeah. And, and I'm sure you get a lot of it on being public as well, right? Because I get a lot of it where people, I don't know, strangers online will tell me that I need to get married, that my focus is completely in the wrong thing. And oh, these like keyboard that. warriors. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And if they had a life, they wouldn't have time to write you these things, just to let you know they're <laughs> lifeless. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so much free time. Right. Yeah. But, okay, so a lot of people tell me that as a woman, I am intimidating, and I'm sure you must get this. And they tell you you have masculine traits because you're financially independent, you are a go-getter, you're a hustler. So, therefore, your pool is definitely smaller, which I agree. You know, the more successful you are as a woman, the smaller the pool of men gets yeah. for you. But then they're like, oh, but then the, the man won't feel like they can be your protector or your provider. So then how, how can someone feel that they can be your partner? What's your take on that? Okay. A lot of people told me that I am in my masculine energy more than my feminine and that I'll never find a partner because I can't Five. balance that. <laughs> yeah. Now, the funny part is that, you know, people don't know your backstory, so it's easy for them to judge and to give opinion. When... I was married or when I was in my, my past relationships and a man didn't wear the pants, I had to take off my skirt and put the pants in the relationship. If a man can't show up and can't be a man and an alpha, then guess what? A you woman to has to be that alpha. So a lot of men in my life forced me to wear the pants because they had their skirts on. <laughs> and this is what people don't understand, that when I have been forced to be masculine by men who were not alphas, and I had to show up for the family and I had to pay the rent, the food, everything. I had to. Now, the beauty of human beings is that both of us, males and females, we have both energies in mm -hmm. us. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we have the feminine and masculine energy. We have to balance them both. But when a woman is in a relationship where the man doesn't show up, she has to put the pants on. So I'm sorry if I'm masculine, but I've been forced to be masculine. Show me an alpha man that is in his true alpha, not in his wounded masculine, but his full-on masculine, mm -hmm. and watch me become a sweet, soft little girl. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. They assume that because on the outside, you are very masculine and yeah. you are independent and all of that, that even in a relationship, you would be the same. But no. most of the times it is not. You want to leave that outside when you go home to your partner. 100%. I need a man that is fully in his energy, masculine energy, and when a man gives that woman that feeling, that safety, that, that energy, that love, you can mm -hmm. feel it. Then a woman deassembles her masculine energy and she falls into her feminine and she becomes a child with that man. But sadly, I have not met those. And I don't know about you. <laughs> no. but, I mean, clearly no. <laughs> but um, yeah, so before next time you people want to judge a woman yeah. for being too masculine, it's like, I'm sorry, but the world made her like that. 
And for her to take off these pants and put on her skirt again, she needs to find a man that's fully balanced and an alpha. Right. Yeah. And I saw this funny TikTok the other day, which was like, I keep being in competition to be the princess in this relationship because men just want to be to have the princess treatment as well now. <laughs> so, babe, in both my marriages, I was a financial provider. No way. Um, it's, it's sad. I was paying for everything. I'm talking A to Z. Everything, electricity, water, food, rent, everything, mortgage, everything. So what did they bring to the table? None. They were they were the girls in the relationship. They were in their wounded feminine energy. Mm. It's like, yeah, it's it's insane because I had to show up. I had to pay. I had to provide. And I know I have a leadership skill. They were just like chilling, you know, in their feminine zone, just like, gimme, 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 gimme. And sadly, a lot of men are like that these days. I'm not saying all men are, yeah. but a lot of men are. Us as women should not be enablers because I was an enabler for so many years for my exes, but not anymore. Mm. Now the minute, now that I'm healing and doing a lot of things for self-growth, it's like the minute I, a man walks in and he's not an alpha, I sniff him right mm. away. And it's like, uh-uh, no. No eye contacts, no fireworks, no butterflies, <laughs> no nothing. Yeah. But were you resented because of that? Because you were no. the provider resented? in the relationship? Yeah. By who? As By in your man? partner, your ex-partner. He loved yeah. it. He loved it. He loved it. Uh, there's someone paying. He was the girl. We switched roles. Oh, my God. I felt like I was the man. Whenever he needed anything, whenever money was needed, whenever anything was wrong, he would come to me. And I was like, God damn it. You know, if I was a guy, I would have been like a, a 10 on 10. I would have been top tier man. Been. Yeah. <laughs> you feel like you're not with a man. Mm. You feel like you're with a woman. Of course. And you envy him because you want to be in that position. <laughs> you want to be taken care of. You want to be protected. Right. You want... Yes. But, but that's the funny thing, because the men of, t of today, right, men of my age, they are Muslim men as well, but they, they don't believe in the whole thing that they need to be the provider. It's an Islam. It's they're, they're, they're like, yeah, but today's time is like 50-50. I mean, no, no, look, I, I, look, let me be honest. If I was with a man that's fully in his alpha energy, mm. in, his fam in his masculine energy, a good, a good partner, he's mm. there for me, he protects me, he does a lot of things, but financially he cannot completely do the job yeah then i don't That's mind fine. yeah then i don't mind going 50 50 or helping my man because we i love support. him it's a partnership right yeah. yeah but imagine he's not understanding not caring not loving not there not supportive but what's your money he's narcissistic and on top of all that you have to pay for that shit yeah. <laughs> it's like no You're for jail at this point it's like, it's like i'm paying to be abused <laughs> yeah. it's like no exactly so yeah it's it's like if you have qualities that add up to what you're missing. Mm. So what you, let's, let me put it this way. If you have qualities that can cover up what you can bring to the table, then I'm more than happy to bring the rest exactly. of it to the table. I'm happy to share the table with you. But to have nothing and to show up like with nothing as a person, no love, no care, no support, no understanding. And then on top of all that, I got to pay for you, mm. princess. <laughs> Get your ass out of here. Exactly, no, exactly. No. Yeah. But okay, so what advice do you have for people like me, you know, young women who are looking for a partner? There's so much pressure coming from society, but also it's really hard to find good quality men. Be careful what you're saying. Because you are manifesting right now. You are projecting to the universe. You you literally just said, I only believe that the men that exist are bad. You literally just said that. <laughs> and then you get upset and that I the men that. that approach you are that. Because you believe in it. You attract what you believe. That's true. If you believe there are only bad men in this world, you will get bad men. Agreed. Why are you upset? That's what you're believing in. A power of manifestation. Mm. But look, there are a lot of good men in this world. But your right question should be, where should I go to find them? Yeah, where do I find them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we're still looking. <laughs> Definitely not the places we were going to. No, no, we're yeah. going in the wrong places. No, I, I feel, look, there are a lot of good men around. Yeah. And I feel like once the intention is set and the belief is there that mm. there are good men, you will go places. You will attract friends that know these kind of men and they will slowly come into your life in that yeah. way. So be careful what you're telling yourself mm -hmm. or even in conversations like this. Yeah. Even like if you're joking around, be careful because that's literally... The commands what you're putting out there. that you're giving the universe. Mm -hmm. You're decoding that message and it's going up and you're going to attract these kind of guys. There are good men. My advice to you is an advice that I've received when I was 36. That was last year from mm -hmm. one of my best friends, Mona Katan. Yeah. She was sitting down and I told her, Mona, now that you're married, what is the secret? Because we both went through toxic relationships yes. in the past, me and her. And she gave me a piece of advice. And I, I remember that day we were sitting at an event. It was her event. I was quiet for the whole night. 
because my mind was processing what she told me. She told me, don't look for a firecracker, look for a fireplace. Oof. And she just left. She just passed me. She's like, hey, baby, don't look for a firecracker, look for a fireplace. And she just left. But she left me with a message that like screwed my mind completely. And it's so true. We always look for these men that, you know, give us butterflies and mm. I go crazy it's when I see him, yeah. explosive and all yeah. that. But that's exactly what you should be avoiding. Look for the fireplace. Look for the man that makes you feel like you're home. You're, you're, calm. you're warm. You're calm. Mm. There might not be firecrackers or butterflies, but he is home to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that switched my mindset completely. So right now... Every time I feel like I'm attracted to a person, and that's an advice my therapist told me. She's like, every time you feel butterflies, run. <laughs> She's like, that means that that's the most toxic type that, yeah. you, that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And that's your body, your gut feeling telling you run, but you're thinking it's butterflies. She's like, just <laughs> run. Yeah. yeah, she's like, go for the people that you feel like they're not really attractive in the beginning. Mm. They're not your type in the beginning. Get to know people. And she's like, that's when you find your fireplace. So, mm. so that, that piece of advice is very important. Oh, I love and that. And I feel like before you want to start a relationship, you really, really need to go and work on yourself. You want to show up for that person. If you really love love and you want to have an, a relationship that, that lasts and a relationship that's healthy, go work on your demons, work on your issues, heal. Don't come and bring your issues to a relationship. Don't bleed on the people that didn't cut you. And that's a mistake a lot of people do when they walk into a relationship unhealed. Mm. They literally destroy the relationship. It could have been the best. This might be your, your right one. Yeah. But how would you know? You came in unprepared. You came in unhealed. So really go work on your traumas, your issues before starting a relationship. Because that's an investment. That's a life commitment. Because to me, I don't date for fun. I don't go out for fun. I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. I feel like people's feelings are sacred. And relationships are an investment, just like a business. I don't put my money where I know I'm going to lose it. So when I'm with somebody, I'm with them for the long run, for a future. And if that scares men away, then so be it. Mm. You're not my type. But this is what I'm looking for. So if I'm investing, then I should put my whole heart and soul into this and show up the best version I am. Show up as the best version of me. So that, that's my advice for you. I love that. Yeah. That, that that makes so much sense. I'm going to take some time to think. I mean, we have a fireplace here, to be honest. Yeah, baby. Fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fireplace. But, okay, final question, I guess, um, would be, today for you, how do you define success? Okay. This is, I love this question, because success is not the definition you see in the dictionary. Success is defined individually by each one. Some people, to them, success is the amount of money they have in the bank. Some people's success for them is the amount of certificates on their wall or what chair are they sitting in, what position in a company. But that's not a unified definition. So don't feel intimidated because you might be successful, but you feel like you're not because X, Y, Z told you success is this, this, and this. To me, success is what have I done for myself? And after doing that, what have I done for others? Mm. That's the definition of success. So whether I have the money, whether I have that car or not, whether I have that position or not, if I'm doing everything I can for me, and then after I found that place, I'm doing everything I can for others, I'm successful. I feel like I've made it. So don't let people tamper with the definition of success or give you their definition of it. It's not a location I can drop on Google Maps for you guys to come and become successful. It's everyone's journey, their own definition, their own pace, their own their own style. Just choose the definition you want and just feel like you are successful. Don't undermine every step you take in your life because it is a success. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. And this was a wonderful chat. I, hope I you know, enjoyed I had it. a great time. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. Thank you so much for being here, Sarah. It's my pleasure. And we'll see you all in the next one. Thank you. <laughs>